Black Op Radio presents 50 Reasons for 50 Years. Why the Warren Commission may be the greatest fraud perpetrated on the American public. Now your host, Len Osanek. As we have shown in great detail, the assassination was the removal of a president. The evidence exonerates a lone gunman. And certainly, Lee Oswald was what he said he was, a patsy. The evidence which leads to the real sponsors should have a trail. And the cover-up of those leads says a lot itself about who planned the murder. While Johnson was on the plane making a getaway from the crime scene, we discover he was getting reports as if someone had a whole prepared scenario ready for the press from the White House Situation Room. And can you imagine just hours after the shooting, they told Air Force One, one man, no conspiracy. Is there recordings of what was relayed to Air Force One as it made its getaway back to Washington? Researcher Bill Kelly reveals what is known. I'm Bill Kelly. I'm a JFK assassination researcher. I run the blog called JFK Counter Coup. The Air Force One radio tapes are the black box of the assassination accident, and they tell us a lot. What's not on the tapes is even maybe more important, what the uh, military excised from the tapes. The Warren Commission did not have access to the Air Force One radio tapes and nor did they ask for them. The first hint of them came out in William Manchester's book when he went to the White House and LBJ allowed him to read the transcript of the unedited tapes that he quotes from. The LBJ library released their copy of the tape in the late 70s and that was a cassette tape. It was about an hour and a half long. Now the Clifton tapes were found among the effects of Air Force aid to the President General Chester Clifton and this tape is about a half hour longer than the old LBJ library tape that we've had for years, but both tapes contain unique information. Andrew, assigned to interview, sir. Colonel Norman, General LeMay is aid. Right. General LeMay is in a C-140. Right. Three numbers are 497. Sam, C-140. 497, last three numbers. Right. He's inbound. His code name is Grandson, and I want to talk to him. Grandson. Okay, sir, we'll see what we can do. Uh, we're real busy with Air Force One right now. Okay, uh, you don't have a capability to work more than one, huh? Uh, well, we're running uh, Air Force One on two different frequencies. We're giving them two different patches at one time right now, and that's all we can do. The Clifton tape is a reel-to-reel tape, so it's an older generation tape, a better quality tape. It's labeled White House Communication Agency, and we think that from the information on this tape, we might be able to track down where the other tapes are. We know a lot of what's not on the tapes because three reporters, William Manchester, T.H. White, and Pierre Salinger were given access to a transcript of the unedited tapes. So we know the unedited tapes existed at one time. These three reporters quoted items off the tapes that aren't on there today. They edited out a lot of the military references. Chris, I have a look at the Anaheim with priority one patch. Roger. One of the unique aspects of my research is the identity of the Liberty Station, Collins Radio. They were the Liberty Station. When you listen to the tapes, you hear them talk, Liberty, Liberty, uh, give me this frequency, uh, send me with this relay. They asked Liberty Station a hundred times on the tapes to do something. And the Liberty Station is the Collins Radio headquarters in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, where they had the contract for the radio relays of all the communications aboard Air Force One and the cabin of planes and the Strategic Air Command, General LeMay's bomber fleet. I was already familiar with Collins Radio because on November 1st, 1963, the New York Times reported that the CIA radar ship that had dropped off commandos in Cuba was leased to the Collins Radio Company of Richardson, Texas, which is affiliated with the one in, in Cedar Rapids. So Collins was serving as a cover for the CIA radar ship on November 1st, 1963, and they had worked with the CIA and other military uh, operations before. In fact, Art Collins, the founder of the company, was a personal friend of Air Force General Curtis LeMay, who was a ham radio buff. LeMay gave all the Strategic Air Command contracts to Collins, and they also received the contracts to handle the Air Force One radio communications. If you read a book called Coup d'etat, a practical handbook, 
it tells you how to conduct a coup. And if the assassination was, in fact, a real coup d'etat, the coup members would have to control the communications. That's part of the uh, key elements of a coup. We look at the communications links here and Collins Radio and what's going on, and we see that those people that were in charge and had control over the communications network hated Kennedy. LeMay and these people despised Kennedy and were glad he was killed. They were his enemies. At the time of the assassination, Air Force One pilot James Swindell was listening to the Secret Service transmissions from the Dallas motorcade on Charlie Channel, which if the Charlie Channel is recorded, it will contain the sounds of the, the final two shots. President Kennedy had ordered the Air Force One radio transmissions recorded only when the plane is in the air. So when LBJ got back to Air Force One, he made a few phone calls that were not recorded, or they said they weren't recorded. Those conversations are suspicious. LBJ called a lawyer named Goldberg from the Air Force One, and he also talked to another lawyer named J. Whitey Bullion. Bullion was a tax attorney. LBJ said, I'll have to sell my Halliburton stock now. And of course, Halliburton was the uh, Texas company that was one of the big defense contractors that got a lot of business when LBJ became president. The other call was to a lawyer named Goldberg, and he told LBJ to be sworn in right away and to have Sarah Hughes do it. There's no mention of Goldberg in any of the mainstream books or the official record. We only learned about it from Goldberg's obituary when he died. When the plane took off, the uh, White House Communication Agency apparently began to tape record all of the conversations. And there were three radios on board that were being used at the time. And all three were busy the whole time the plane was in the air, two hours and 17 minutes. So we estimate there was three radios going for over two hours. There should be at least six hours of tape conversation, but in fact, we only have two hours. That was the pinnacle of our government there all in one plane trying to figure out what happened in those two hours and 17 minutes will tell us a lot about what happened in the assassination. The cabinet plane with the cabinet members on it were over the Pacific Ocean at the time of the assassination, and their response to the assassination is really important. Pierre Salinger was on that flight, and he contacted the White House Situation Room and attempted to get all the information he could on what was happening in Dallas. Situation room, this is Wayside. You read me over? Air Force One received the information about Oswald being the assassin. Reportedly came from the White House Situation Room where the Navy aide, Oliver Hallett, was telling Air Force One Oswald was the assassin and it was no conspiracy. This has also been attributed to McGeorge Bundy. None of this is on the tape that we have, but we do know that Oliver Hallett, the, the guy who was heard on the tapes talking to Air Force One, knew Oswald. His previous assignment was the U.S. Embassy in Moscow where he was a Navy attache. And his wife was Snyder's secretary, so when Oswald defected three years earlier, he handed his passport to Snyder. Hallett's wife was right there and uh, later testified about Oswald's behavior. And so when Oliver Hallett in the Situation Room was telling the Air Force One that Oswald was the assassin, he knew Oswald, which I find astounding coincidence. I think there's other tapes out there that we can look for and maybe locate, and someday in the future we can have a complete picture of what happened on that return flight on November 22nd, 1963. Stay tuned for the next installment as we expose week after week 50 lies the Warren Commission would like you to believe.